but Smith went home horrified and alerted police. Brady and Hindley were described by the judge of their court case as two sadistic killers of the utmost depravity. Brady spent 19 years in mainstream prisons before being declared criminally insane in 1985 and sent to Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital, then to Ashworth Hospital in Liverpool, having made it clear he never wants to be released. She should be in prison and left there to rot because she shouldn't be on the surf at all. She should be, she should be taught she like she taught them kids. However, Hindley campaigned long and hard to get parole, with high-profile supporters such as prison reformer Lord Longford testifying to her change of character, but it was to no avail. Hindley died of a heart attack in 2002, aged 60, only a few weeks before a landmark ruling that judges, not politicians, could set minimum sentences, a finding that might have led to her release, according to QC Michael Zander. I'm sure that the Lord Chief Justice is right to say that there must be that possibility. Who knows? Something may come up or a public opinion may change, after all, uh, for some reason. Or this person who's been 20, 30, 40 years in prison is now an old person or is a sick person uh, and can safely be released and public opinion will, will stand for it. Other killers told that life means life include Hindley's co-conspirator Ian Brady, Yorkshire Ripper Peter Sutcliffe, sadistic murderer Dennis Nilsson, and House of Horrors killer Rosemary West. For a time, Hindley and West were in the same wing of Durham Prison, which became dubbed the Club of the Damned. Richard Milhouse Nixon was a junior congressman from California when he uncovered crucial evidence in the Elger Hiss espionage case. The microfilm documents found buried in a pumpkin patch helped convict Hiss of perjury. But never could Nixon have imagined that he would become a central figure in the biggest political scandal in American history. Nixon was elected to the presidency in 1968 on a platform of opposing the rise of anti-war and hippie counterculture and pushing for an end to America's military engagement in Southeast Asia. Nixon's two closest advisers were his chief of staff, H.R. Haldeman, and assistant in charge of domestic affairs, John Ehrlichman. White House counsel John Dean dubbed them the Berlin Wall for their Teutonic names and habits of secrecy. On June the 17th, 1972, five men were discovered breaking into the Democratic National Committee headquarters inside the Watergate complex. A few months later, along with the masterminds of the break-in, E. Howard Hunt Jr. and G. Gordon Liddy, the five were indicted for conspiracy, burglary, and violation of federal wiretapping laws. But when one of the men, James W. McCord, wrote to the judge claiming a cover-up of the robbery, the floodgates were opened, and the affair snowballed into a massive political scandal that reached all the way to the White House. It was eventually revealed that President Nixon and his government had been involved in an astonishing array of criminal activities, including campaign fraud, political espionage, and wiretapping of not only their political opponents, but also the press and ordinary citizens. A hidden Mexican slush fund was also discovered, used to pay for these activities, provide money for cover-ups, and buy the silence of anyone arrested. But it all began to unravel. In a Senate investigation, former staff members testified against President Nixon and his team. G. Gordon Liddy served four and a half years in jail for his part in the conspiracy before reinventing himself as a radio talkback host, actor and political strategist, and writing a best-selling book. In 1997, he returned to the Watergate complex to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the break-in and broadcast his nationally syndicated radio show from the lobby. Baldwin had a transceiver, and we had a transceiver. And Mr. Baldwin spotted the police officers uh, who were, you know, coming down toward the thing, and he was he was doing what he was supposed to do. He was uh, calling over and saying, okay, there's the, he, he asked, he said, 
are our guys dressed in hippie clothes? And we said, no, no, no way our guys are dressed in hippie clothes. They're all dressed like businessmen. And he said, well, there's, there's hippie clothes people coming. And he said, and they got guns. And that's when we're trying to, we're trying to get a hold of these people. But they had turned down the gain on their transceiver, so they, they couldn't read all these, uh, these things. And finally, we just heard one little phrase from them. They were whispered, they got us. And that's how we knew that, uh, you know, it was all over. As it turned out, it was all over for Nixon's presidency, too although it took another two years for the Watergate evidence to mount up. It was revealed largely thanks to Washington Post reporters Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein and their infamous anonymous source, W. Mark Felt, codenamed Deep Throat. Nixon continued to deny knowing anything about the Watergate crimes. I had no prior knowledge of the Watergate break. -in. I neither took part in nor knew about any of the subsequent cover-up activities. But others testified otherwise, and White House counsel John Dean became the star witness of the Senate Watergate Committee, implicating both former Attorney General John Mitchell and President Nixon in the cover-up. As Dean had no evidence other than his notes, his testimony was not given much weight until it came to light that Nixon had recorded many of the conversations he'd had during his presidency. The tapes were subpoenaed by the inquiry and contained shattering revelations including evidence of illicit campaign contributions, secret bombings of Cambodia, and widespread illegal wiretappings and harassment of Nixon's opponents. The fallout led to threats of impeachment, but Nixon forestalled this action by stepping down as president. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Seven former presidential aides were indicted for their role in the scandal, and four of them, including Haldeman and Ehrlichman, were convicted and served jail time. Altogether, 19 conspirators went to prison for Watergate. However, Nixon was not among them. On September the 8th, 1974, President Gerald Ford, who took over from Nixon, controversially granted the former president a full and unconditional pardon for any crimes he may have committed during his presidency. Coming up, O.J. Simpson's infamous life. Hundred and seventy five South Bundy Drive, Brentwood, Los Angeles. On the twelfth of June, nineteen ninety four, Nicole Brown Simpson, aged thirty five, and her friend, twenty five year old Ronald Goldman, were brutally murdered in the driveway of this home. The prime suspect was Nicole's ex husband, Orenthal James Simpson, known to the world as OJ, who was filmed being chased by police on Interstate 405. The football legend, sports commentator, and sometimes movie star was eventually arrested and charged with the crimes. Four days after the case, Simpson appeared in court for his arraignment and pleaded not guilty to the two murders. The following trial lasted nine months and attracted so much global publicity, it was dubbed the trial of the century. The court case made many of the people involved in it familiar figures. Judge Lance Ito found himself the subject of television comedy parodies. Prosecutor Marsha Clark and leading members of the defense team, like Johnny Cochran, also found themselves in the spotlight. Although there was a great deal of DNA evidence against Simpson, in the end, it seemed as if the prosecution's case rested on its ill-advised decision to have Simpson try on one of the blood-soaked gloves implicated in the murders. Perhaps it had shrunk due to the blood or following a freezing and thawing process. Perhaps it's true that Simpson had stopped taking arthritis medication, resulting in swelling of his joints, or maybe he simply wasn't guilty. Whatever the reason, the glove clearly did not fit, and the jury took only three hours of deliberation before acquitting him on both charges. However, in February 1997, the case took an even more bizarre turn when a civil jury in Santa Monica found Simpson guilty of the wrongful death of Goldman, as well as battery against both Goldman and Nicole Simpson. But Simpson refused to pay the $33 million in civil damages awarded to the Goldman family. Controversy flared again when Simpson attempted to publish a book called 
If I Did It in 2006. The Goldman family took him to court and won the right to collect 90% of the book's profits to satisfy the unpaid civil judgment. In 2007, O.J. Simpson was back in court for allegedly stealing sports memorabilia from a Las Vegas hotel room. He and his two co-defendants, Clarence C.J. Stewart and Charles Ehrlich, were bound over for trial on a total of 12 charges. Prosecutors say the men stormed into the hotel room of sports collectors Alfred Beardsley and Bruce Fromong at the Palace Station Hotel and took thousands of dollars worth of Simpson's own memorabilia at gunpoint. Officials charged him with kidnapping with a deadly weapon, robbery with a deadly weapon, and assault and conspiracy to commit kidnapping, robbery and burglary, among other crimes. In January 2008, Simpson was again in front of a judge facing allegations that he had violated his bail conditions. And when I tell you, Mr. Simpson, there are conditions and there are rules, let me make sure that you understand that if you violate those rules... The 60-year-old has said he was not stealing the memorabilia, but taking back what belonged to him. He remains free on bail of a quarter of a million dollars, but if convicted of the charges, He's facing the inside of a jail cell for the rest of his life. On the 30th of May, 1996, Sarah Thornton walked free after serving five and a half years of a life sentence for murdering her husband as he lay in an alcoholic stupor. An appeal over her original conviction saw her murder charge overturned in favor of a manslaughter verdict. If the truth had come out six years ago, seven years ago, look how much pain and time and money it would have saved everybody. Sarah Thornton admitted stabbing her husband Malcolm with a kitchen knife as he lay drunk on the sofa at their Warwickshire home in 1989. She said it was her husband's violent behavior towards her that caused her to snap. However, during sentencing, the judge found her responsibility for killing him was diminished, not because of provocation, but because she suffered from a severe abnormality of mind. A jury of eight men and four women deliberated for six hours before returning the verdict. At a press conference after her release, sitting next to daughter Louise, Thornton said she believed justice had been served. The five years I got, for me, yeah, I think that's fair. I'm not saying that every woman should be sent to prison, but for me it was fair I took a life at the end of the day. But Malcolm Thornton's family was disappointed with the result. People get 15, 20 years for armed robbery. Five years for taking someone's life. It's disgusting. While Sarah's walked free, it's not a total victory because she hasn't proved she was a battered wife. She's proved instead that she's got a severe personality disorder. Although there was much publicity about the use of provocation as a defense in Thornton's case, ultimately, it didn't set a legal precedent. This cannot set a precedent by itself. It is a trial by a judge and a jury at Oxford Crown Court. The precedents are set by higher courts, in the Court of Appeal, for example. Although Thornton celebrated her freedom, she said she was unable to forgive herself for causing her husband's death. Jack the Ripper. Does the name Bucks Row mean anything to you? How about the name of the person most commonly associated with it, Jack the Ripper? This is Whitechapel, the area in the East End of London where a number of women working as prostitutes were mutilated and murdered towards the end of the 19th century. To this day, there remains much debate about not only who Jack the Ripper really was, but which of the women in the Whitechapel murders were actually his victims. Out of the 11 bodies, though, there's a group known as the Canonical Five. These are believed firmly to have been the Ripper's victims. Mary Ann Nichols, nicknamed Polly, was the first of these, killed on the 31st of August, 1888, five days after her 43rd birthday. 
her body was discovered in the early hours of the morning on Bucks Row. Bucks Row, which has since been renamed Derwood Street, was a back alley in Whitechapel, a couple of hundred meters away from the London Hospital. Some of the original buildings and brickwork still exist today, including a low brick wall stretching east from the board school. Polly's body was found near the wall's corner. Whitechapel is now home to a niche tourist industry as people come from all over the world to take guided tours around the sites of the murders. Number two of the canonical five was Annie Chapman, who also had a nickname, Dark Annie. She was found on the 8th of September, dead in a backyard in Spittlesfields with her uterus removed. Throughout the police investigation, a huge number of letters were sent to the police. Most of them were declared hoaxes, but there were a handful that the police took more seriously. The first of these was the Dear Boss letter received on the 28th of September. It was the first time the serial killer signed himself Jack the Ripper and also referred to clipping a lady's ears off, which rang alarm bells the very next day. The 30th of September, 1888, became known as the double event because two women were found close together on the same day. Victim number three was Elizabeth Stride, also known as Long Liz. The Swedish-born 43-year-old was found in the early hours in Dutfield's yard off Burner Street. Like Bucks Row, Burner Street was also renamed to play down the ghoulish connotations. Catherine Eddowes was a bit different. Her body was found outside Whitechapel in Mitre Square in the city of London. This was the furthest west of all the murders, and the fact that she was found on the same day as Elizabeth Stride has made some ripperologists, as those who study the case are called, claim her body as proof that there wasn't just one ripper, but at least two killers at large at the same time. The Royal London Hospital on Whitechapel Road still has some crime scene drawings and plans of the Mitre Street murder. It was Eddow's corpse that persuaded the police that the dear boss letter was probably genuine. As well as missing a uterus and a kidney, she was found with one ear severed. The next missive attributed to the killer was the Saucy Jack postcard, which was delivered on the 1st of October and referred to both ear removal and the so-called double event. Journalists already knew those details, however, so the card could still have been a hoax. With such widespread publicity and reporting of the murders, citizens were understandably nervous, and one of them, George Lusk, led the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee to patrol the streets. It was to Lusk that the next letter was addressed, it is widely thought to be the most authentic epistle, largely because it arrived accompanied by a box containing half a human kidney. The writer made a gruesome claim about the other half. I fried and ate it, the letter said. It was very nice. The last of the canonical five was Mary Jane Kelly, nicknamed Ginger. She was the only one of the five found indoors, discovered on the bed of her single-room home at Miller's Court in Spitalfields on November the 9th. Even with contemporary technology, we are still no closer to solving the mystery, and the list of possible suspects seems only to grow as the years go by. The briefest survey will throw up at least 25 names of long-dead possibilities. The mystique behind the murderous mystery has grown over the years and many people have devoted their lives to researching the case. And at London's police headquarters at Scotland Yard, a museum of crimes from the past contains a number of exhibits on the city's most famous unsolved crime. In 2006, the museum was presented with a book containing a handwritten note made by the investigating officer, naming the man he suspected of being the notorious killer. Over the years, suspects have included Montague John Druitt, a 31-year-old barrister and schoolteacher, and Dr. Francis J. Tumblety, an American quack doctor who was arrested in 1888 for gross indecency. But Chief Inspector Donald Sutherland Swanson believed a Polish man, Aaron Kosminski, was responsible for the murders. The book was handed to the museum by Swanson's great-grandson, Neville. It's by Sir Robert Anderson, who was my great-grandfather's boss at Scotland Yard, and this is one, one of his many memoirs called The Lighter Side of My Official Life. And he presented a copy to my great-grandfather as they'd worked closely together for many years. 
and my great-grandfather sat down and read it and made certain pencil annotations in parts where he thought he could add to the picture. And there's certain notations there which name the, who he thinks was the, the killer was? Yes, at the very end of his uh, penciled notes, uh, he says Kosminski was the suspect. And how convinced are you that he knew that that was the person? Uh, I'm convinced because he was in day-to-day, hour-to-hour control of the case. He saw every piece of paper, spoke to every witness, um, and he was completely convinced um, that this was the man. The name of Kosminski has been known for nearly 30 years. At the time of the murders, he was watched by police and later placed in a mental asylum. The murder stopped. The book is a welcome addition to the museum. Everything, uh, the genuine items, were all down at the um, National Archives. So we would have no more than anybody else. And so to have this one item in its uniqueness, we we're very, very pleased to get it. But even a policeman's suspicions won't be enough to end the debate about who Jack the Ripper really was. There will always be speculation. There will always be people that have their own theory. Um, you will never stop that.